thank you all for coming for our break. It's really wonderful to see everybody in person. Um, we've been doing these by Zoom, and I think that this is one of our first in-person events in the museum, so it's terrific that you could all be here. Um, we are going to be presenting today three faculty members who are exhibiting in this exhibition. I'm going to give an introduction for each one of them, and then we'll move through uh, the three speakers. We'll start with Julie Holcomb. Uh, Emily Worley is next, and then Leah Woods. So, Julie Holcomb, in 2015, Professor Holcomb was awarded an Excellence in Teaching Award. In the write-up for that award, it mentions her teaching strategy is to develop adaptability, critical thinking, and risk-taking. And these are learned traits that Professor Holcomb utilized in her most recent body of work, when the loss of her camera and the COVID lockdown led to further explorations of collage, a method that she had long utilized in her digital work, but then she began assembling uh, paper collages. So we'll get to learn about that body of work. Emily Learning, Emily Move, up there you are. <laughs> Emily is a UNH graduate who received her BFA in 2018. Her studio practice focuses on functional utilitarian ceramic objects. She writes that her uh, functional objects force an interaction between people and her work. Her interests are in creating simple forms with an emphasis on strong lines and pattern to create texture. She finds comfort in the repetition of the pattern in addition to making the same form on the potter's wheel. The unpredictable nature of the process challenges her to make more work, and she strives to make pieces that someone connects with and finds comfort in using. And then our final speaker is Leah. Glad you could join us, Leah. Uh, Leah teaches woodworking, both non-functional and furniture-making techniques, with interests ranging from geography to the figure to outdoor sculpture. Her artwork varies in content, technique, and function. And over the years, she has designed and built several bodies of work exploring such concepts as personal wardrobe cabinets, investigating clothing and the female form, footloose, a series of cabinets for high-heeled shoes, structures, an investigation of mannequins and dress forms, and most recently, navigations and exploration of autobiographical maps. So again, thank you all for being here. We will start with Professor Holcomb. Hello, welcome. Thank you all for uh, coming today. Thank you, Christina, for uh, putting this show together, curating, hanging the walls, uh, hanging up the work on the walls, um, and also to Laura Calhoun, who's also so uh, helpful in um, the work of the World War Museum. Uh, where do you begin talking about work? Uh, I have two photographs that is a um, longer term project. Uh, the one on the left is called uh, Babylon Revisited, and the one that I did in 2004. And then the one on the right is a uh, reiteration of that from, um, I ended that piece in 2019. So that's a longer series of work that has been evolving over a long period of time. They. Um, are photographs that I shot myself. I originally would not have considered myself a street photographer, but I think today I would consider myself a street photographer. I take uh, photographs from, um, from my life uh, and from my travels, and then I collage it to tell a new narrative. So they're decisive moments reinterpreted to tell a story. And um, these two pieces are based um, from 9-11, uh, I was working in 2001, when 9-11 happened, I was working in the Visual Resource Center, and I was basically putting slides away for my job, and um, the day that 9-11 happened, I, one of the slides I was putting away was a Peter Voigel, uh the Elder slide, and, uh, which is a 16th century painter, and uh, it's a narrative based on, uh, from the Bible, uh, the, the story of the, our language and um, 
how the people came together in Babylon, wanted to communicate, um, and wanted to get closer to God, so they built this um, built this structure um, to go to the heavens. And um, but God punished, and they spoke one language, and uh, supposedly, as the story goes, and um, they could no longer. Um, God wanted to punish them and made it so that they spoke uh, many different languages so they could no longer communicate and then the building the structure fell. So when I was working in that side library, uh, we had a huge archive of lantern signs, glass plates, and as I was going through the glass lantern side plates, I noticed a lot of architectural buildings that um, had been photographed and then had been crossed out with the date that the uh, architectural building had been destroyed. So in that experience of working in that slide library, and then when 9-11 happened, and I, that day I was putting that slide away, it just felt like an intuitive moment um, that I wanted to make this piece. And so I started uh, working on it. I took, it took two years to make that photograph. It has about 200 photographs collaged into it through using Photoshop. I did not know how to use Photoshop. I taught myself. Um, the summer prior to um, the summer, a couple months before 9-11, I was working on an archaeological dig in Italy. And uh, I was photographing these tiny little terracotta tiles. And through that job, I was all these little tiny parts that I was finding, I was able to uh, collage them together to make what these broken tiles might eventually look like. Um, it wasn't scholarly work, it was just something I wanted to do um, to, because I, I was photographing so many of the pieces, I started making matches, and just through my memory, so. Anyways, that, I think, narrative folded into that experience of 9-11, just um, how history repeats itself, so in a way of using uh, Peter Boyle's painting as a reference point, um, and how history, as a metaphor for history, repeating itself. So um, I did that piece in graduate school and continued working on it because my original idea was to include every single city across the globe. And so through my life, I just keep working on it and building it. So it's gone through so many different iterations. I take screenshots of it. Um, the original file was about uh, 648 megabytes. The one on the right is now eight gigabytes. And uh, it, my computer, it was my computer that broke last year. And uh, it used to take, on my old computer, it would take 20 minutes just to open up the file. 30 minutes to save it. My new computer, I opened up that file today on my new computer, uh, it took two minutes. So just to give you a little reference point of um, processing speed and power. Um, and the first photograph I shot with a little point shoot. The second, um, the new variation iteration uh, is shot with a high-end um, DSLR camera. So it has a lot more memory, a lot more uh, data uh, that you have to pack into it. So, uh, what else do I want to say? So it just keeps evolving. So eventually, I, one of my other ideas for this body of work is to do a video animation of all the different iterations of how it's evolved over the last um, 20 years that I've been working on this piece. Um, and then, let's see our time. So yeah, last, uh, Christina touched upon that. Um, my equipment broke, and I basically, I was heading, you know, COVID had just happened in the spring of 2020, and I was go walking into a uh, sabbatical for the fall of 2020, which was perfect timing. I was like, oh, what a perfect time to take a break. Uh, but my computer broke. <clears throat> when I went to get it service, they said, well, there are no computers, uh, especially the computer you want. You know, you should wait because we're getting a better computer in the fall. Um, and so I just put that work on pause, my digital work, and thought maybe I would just work in a different manner for a little while. So. Um, I collect a lot of books and at thrift stores and a lot of art history books. And so I had an idea to do this large collage with uh, all these female figures, new figures from um, modern art books. 
And I just started cutting out the female figurative forms. And as I was taking the scraps, um, I started realizing that there was, a, there was more to the work than what I was originally working on. So you're, what we're looking at in these small collages are actually the scraps from the bigger collage that I'm working on. I think the bigger collage will probably take as long as one of these other pieces, two years, probably I've already been working on it for a year. Um, but it's basically all the new female figures from modern painters. <laughs> and so I'm taking those that negative space and collaging it into other modernist um, paintings um, and creating a conversation and telling a different type of story. But I think this work for me, because I've always traditionally done collage work through using Photoshop and doing it through a computer, through you know, uh, electricity, and working this other method where I'm actually cutting uh, books, paper with an exacto blade, and then actually uh, scanning in those parts into the computer. Um, some of these are actually two pieces, some of them are three pieces, but then I do another intervention, which is I probably clean, I clean some of the parts up in Photoshop. So it goes through a three-part cycle. And, and then, yeah, and I think it's also referencing, you know, the, the history of art, I think Western art, um, the, the canon of art history, and, um, and it's also, I think, I'm curating these collections from these books and what I'm interested in. I think it's also helping me think about composition and color, and also I think the representation of the female form too. And I think the I guess one thing I want to point out is the you know part of this feels like the, they're part fact and they're part fiction. They're part from like they're part autobiographical, but they're also historical as well. Uh, the I feel in many ways we're you know somehow repeat you know we're repeating our family story, we're, we're repeating things that have happened in history, and those kind of patterns. So I think I'm really interested in that pattern of our environment, of society, and those, I think, some of those cultural implications uh, that happen in our own, in our own documentation and archive. I think that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> so is there any questions? Leah? Um, I love the fact that you've been working on this idea that you started in 2004, or at least this image. 2002. 2002. Yeah. 2002. And um, so working on a project for so long, what are some of the ways that you're thinking about it now that you that are, are noticeably different from how you were thinking about it then? I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, I guess I'm wondering, you know, like we start out with an idea and we want to pursue it in the moment, but then sometimes if that idea has a long time to percolate, we begin to think about that idea from different perspectives or um, different materials, or I guess I'm thinking like that is such a it's such a long amount of time, and you have changed, you know, just as a human over that time. Like, are there ways that you're thinking about constructing these cities, the images, putting putting different images together, that where you're thinking about things that are a little bit different than what you were originally thinking about, maybe in terms of what you want city to convey or who you want it to connect to or 
how you find your images or anything like that. I'll try to answer what I think you're saying. Um, I think partly when I first started, I think it was really thinking about like the collective, the collective experience, like even like the way books are put together. That's curated by you know the author, the publisher. So in my own sense, like I'm photographing the landscape, I'm curating for my own collection to make this image, and I want you know. Uh, so, but I also find things out in our landscape ugly sometimes, brutal. Even like when I think about the transformation, I grew up in Portsmouth. The Portsmouth in Hampshire was very different than it is now. It, it, the architecture looks very different, and it seems more brutal to me. That's my personal perspective. So, and that's a life experience. So I think as, you know, even when I was going through that old, you know, lantern slide collection, like a lot of those beautiful buildings were destroyed. And I think, why were they destroyed? You know, even thinking of thinking about um, Ian Hayes, you know, the Twin Towers collapsing, like those were beautiful architectural sort of, in my opinion, but other people said, well, they were, you know, built poorly, they were constructed poorly, they weren't made to withstand, you know, to airplanes and its fuel crashing into it. So, um, so I think as I, those things come to mind as I keep continuing making something, is thinking about the, the beauty and the ugliness of that collective experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I always enjoy your work. I find the bridging or your standing on different um, sources. One is a tradition um, in the way you use um, architecture uh, from the past and all the way to the present. And, and another way I find you always um, um, looking for something fresh and new. Um, I'm always impressed with your ability to put in the two things together and seemingly able to find a sense of hope, even when the, 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 the history repeats itself is kind of a heavy, but I'm really I'm watching such a heavy subject, I can feel there's a sense of beauty to me that's a sense of hope. Is that right? Sometimes. Like, like personally, like, I feel like the older version is more hopeful than the newer version. Interesting. And, it, and even just having this conversation, I feel it's like, I can't wait for the next iteration of it because it seems less hopeful. It seems rougher, cruder, you know, that, that seems like more of that brutalist period in architecture. And so it's not as soft and refined. Um, it almost has like too much information, right? Too much of the concrete jungle in it, right? And when we think of New York City, it, it was designed to have parks and gardens, and this one does not. So I need to bring the hope, I think, back. All right, well, thank you very much, thank Julie. You. I got a double concentration in ceramics and drawing, and I've mostly just pursued the ceramics directly. I think there are hints of my um, love of drawing and surface kind of in my work, um, but it's not something that I directly do. I don't uh, necessarily draw anymore. But after I graduated, I went to North Carolina and did an artist residency, a year-long artist residency, at a ceramic studio where I was teaching classes, I was um, 
taking workshops, so they would host artists that came and taught different um, techniques. And one artist that really stuck, uh, stuck out to me was Ron Philbeck. So he taught us his thing, which was working with slip. So slip is liquid clay. Um, and I do that on the surface of my pieces. So the liquid clay, you use an immersion blender to get out all the lumps and bumps. So it's nice, a nice, like, smooth uh, mud, essentially. And I throw all my work on the wheel. So I threw these pieces on the wheel, and then right after I finished throwing the initial form, I take the slip and I slap it on there and I have the wheel spinning, so I smooth it to create a nice smooth layer of the, the slip. And then I either take my finger or a tool called a rib, which is um, kind of like a kidney-shaped um, plastic tool or silicone tool, um, and create surface designs in them. So I have kind of been stuck on that ever since uh, it was introduced to me in 2019. I've just kind of um, tried doing it on different forms. So I was kind of nervous to do it on these forms, um, their traditional ginger jar form with the, with the curves. Um, and previously I've been doing it on kind of straight-sided pieces, like you can see my bottles over there. And the lines read a little bit different on a straight surface as opposed to a curved surface. So these were a fun challenge. I wanted kind of a, a bigger piece, big for me, because um, I make functional work. They were a fun challenge, challenge to play with um, the surface and the pattern that I wanted. So I did a couple um, go-arounds, like I, I tried a couple different patterns and then I'd erase it out and add more slip and go back into it and add um, the patterns. But I'm pretty happy with how these came out. Um, but of course, after you initially make the piece, you're not done with ceramics. You have to move on to the next part. So you have to fire these in the kiln and then glaze them. So glaze is the color. And you can think of it as like melted glass. It's not necessarily melted glass, but it's a lot of chemistry involved. Um, so each of these has two glazes layered on top of each other, and they have to be just the right consistency when you are um, dipping them in. Um, so these two are actually the same glazes. One, one time I dipped it in, it was just a little bit thinner. So this one, I had a kind of a brown glaze underneath see it peeking through. And then I dipped it into a green glaze and it was a little thinner. Maybe I didn't hold it for the two to three seconds. I just kind of dipped it in and out. So you can see the brown kind of hinting through this piece more than this one. You see more of the green peeking through. Um, and I really like focusing on adding the slip and the pattern to the pieces because then you get those moments with the glaze. So I do enjoy just a, uh, a flat, uh, clean surface sometimes. Uh, but when I'm in the mood, I really can only, I can't stop. I have to add the, the slip on there. It's part of the process and like the tactile um, process of scooping up the slip and putting it on there, find it. Um, really satisfying and I think that's where my uh, like drawing and surface comes through like I said I don't necessarily practice drawing anymore but I think it still comes through where I can't have a blank surface I have to kind of mark it up with some sort of um, texture and pattern um, but with these pieces like I said, it was kind of a struggle to figure out what pattern I wanted to do because the, the lines hug the curves differently. Um, I took a little more playing around than the, the bottles over there. But yeah, I'm still stuck on this process. Right now I've been doing it to more like mugs and bowls. I really enjoy smaller um, functional pieces that people use in their everyday home. Even like this piece, it could be considered an urn, something that sits um, 
on your, I don't know, above your fireplace maybe you put someone's ashes in it. Um, or maybe you just use it as a lid jar for trinkets and things. But I like the idea of someone interacting with my piece and using it um, every day or just um, having a, a personal connection with it. Um, but So, do you have any questions about the process? I know I can get really deep into the process of ceramics, so I kind of believe I kind of skip over it a little bit. I have a question not so much about the process. Yeah. So you reference like two different historical forms. So you have the ginger jar mm -hmm. and you have the beer bottles. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell talk a little bit about how you decide on the form? Yeah. Well, so when I was in North Carolina, I uh, met North Carolina is very clay country. Um, everyone basically has a pottery collection, and the studio studio I was at had a bunch of members that came and used it. Um, they could either pay for a week, or a month, a year, and come and make stuff, and they had a lot of dogs, so I did a lot of dog sitting and stayed at their houses. And I was surrounded by these beautiful pottery collections. Um, so I was inspired that when I would go and I would dog sit for these people, I would take pictures of the pottery, I would draw the pottery to like take note of it. And one member that I dog sat for, she had these beautiful ginger jars. They were probably like this big at the base and went up. But then they turned into a lamp. So I, I thought it was, um, I don't know, I was very inspired by the, the shape, not necessarily it being a lamp, but I was inspired the, by the shape of seeing those uh, massive ginger jars. And then um, I, think, I think she also had some of those bottles. Those were kind of directly related to Ron Philbeck, the artist that taught the workshop with the slip. Um, so he, he had a lot of bottle forms, and that's what he like directly taught us. So that's kind of what I clung on to to get that process down and learn how to do the slip. Um, but I think being in North Carolina around all those people that had so much knowledge of the history of clay and just an immense collection um, was really a lot. I still reference and still um, go back to those photos of like when I feel stuck, I'm like, oh, what, what else can I make? What can I try? Um, but uh, I revisited this form this past year because um, Roberto Lugo had a um, show at The Courier, and he makes these massive ginger jars with uh, like illustrated um, drawings on them. So I kind of Whenever I see it pop up in the ceramics world again, I'm like, oh yes, I did like doing that. And then I go back and maybe revisit that form. Um, yeah. Any other questions? So, this is a piece that I finished in 2014, uh, 2019. In 2017, I was invited to participate in an exhibition called Domestic Matters, the Art of the Apron. And the curator is a woman has organized many shows that some have been furniture-based, some have been wood-based. This one in particular, Domestic Matters, was a show where she brought together about 25 artists in, who work in different materials. So there um, were a couple woodworkers, ceramicists, painters, textile artists, a couple glass artists. And what she asked all of us to do was to think about the apron and give our interpretation of that. 
And she said the interpretation could be historical, it could be based on gender, shape, uh, personal experience, material, form, anything, you know, basically sort of wide open. And I love the idea, I, I like having a, a somewhat directed way to think about how to generate forms. And so when I initially thought of the ape, and I thought about all that stuff, I thought about what, what is my understanding, like what are the, when I think about an apron, what do I think of? And so I thought about frilly aprons, I thought about um, professors who wear aprons in classes when they're working. I thought about all of these different associations, and all of those associations were interesting, but none of them felt really connected to something that I might make. So the more I kept thinking about the apron, the more I came back to what my personal remembering is of what it means to me. And as a kid, my mom stayed at home with my sister and I until I was five. And she was in some ways our primary caretaker. She didn't do all the cooking, and she never wore an apron when she was cooking. But the more I thought about the idea of I can't disassociate an apron from my mom, my mom makes me think of my grandmother, my grandmother makes me think of my great-grandmother. All of these women in my mom's family have been very strong, very competent and capable women. So the more I thought about this image of the apron, the more I, I felt like I was thinking about that lineage of, of women within their households and the things that they did for their families as caretakers. And when I thought about caretakers, I thought, well, that's not just feeding. That is picking you up from school when you're done, or dropping you off at a play date, or getting a snack for you, or, you know, like all of those little things, thousands of little things that somebody does to make sure that they're providing for you, making sure that you're safe, making sure that you're fed, clothed, etc. And, and so the more I started thinking about all of those activities, the more that image sort of just kind of loomed large in my mind. And I didn't know exactly what the form was as I was having these thoughts, but I was drawing and I make a lot of models with cardboard and paper. And so the more I thought about this idea of this sort of all-encompassing idea of the caretaker, I felt like that was in some way volumetric. And so I, in order to create uh, models, I take cardboard and I'll cut little strips of it and hot glue it to a backing. And so I was creating these forms that were coming out of the wall and they were, you know, maybe 12 inches tall. So I would create these forms and slowly they, they started to take on the shape of a figure. And I got to the point that I'm sure we can all, that everyone can relate to, where you think about an idea and you work on an idea and then you hit a wall and you think, I, I don't know where else I can take that idea. I don't know what else to continue. And so I hit that wall and, and I was looking at these forms that I had hot glued to these sheets of cardboard. And sometimes in that moment, you can find yourself making a decision that feels uncomfortable or scary or wrong or weird. And so I did exactly that. And so I just pulled these forms off of the cardboard. And all of a sudden, I sort of plopped them on my bench and thought, OK, well, what if I tried to make them stand up? And then that became both weird and exciting and, and challenging to think about all of those things that go into play. Like how physically, how can I get this thing to stand up? What in the world is it? You know, like I was sort of going from the very practical to the very uh, broad ideas. And I think as I began working on those models, I began to realize that 
all along I have been thinking of this idea of the caretaker as a role that somebody would step into literally and figuratively. And so without realizing it, once I began to create these cardboard models, I realized that I did like the idea that this was a mask or a costume or something, because it's of the caretakers that I know, that's not the only thing that they do. So I felt like I wanted to portray that, that this was something that someone could step into as one role that they have, but then step out of it to do maybe completely unrelated things. And so eventually, this took me about um, maybe a year and a half to make. I settled on the form, making it in paper and cardboard, and then thought, okay, I have to actually make it out of wood. I could have made it out of other materials, but I like working in wood. And so then I started trying to figure out how to build it. So the, the curves, each one of these faceted pieces is called a stave. A stave is just an individual piece of curved wood. If you think of a wine barrel, wine barrels are composed of individual staves that are held together not with glue, but with those metal straps that people tamp down around them to hold the edges. So they're coopered, which means there's an angle along the edge. And so with these pieces, I started basically building molds so that I could both bend the individual stave and then cut angles along each one of the staves so that I could glue them together so they could retain that form. And in terms of the size, I wanted the height of it all along. I thought of this figure as being just a little bit bigger, bigger than me, like a little bit larger than life. And so I wanted this to be a figure that you could walk up to and you kind of felt like you had to raise your head just to look up to them, like kind of suggesting this all-encompassing view. Two years later, and a ton of work. <laughs> so that is it. Thank you. Leah? Yes. Um, it looks like that's oak that you used. How did you make the, the curves? So, so it is, it's red oak, and it's dyed, it's stained on the outside, and it's bleached on the inside, so it's the same material. Whereas the, um, the frame, this is maple, um, in order to each one, in order to make each one of the bent laminated curves, you can see that the bottom has one shape, this section has one shape, and this section has one shape. So for the three different shapes, I made a mold out of MDF, um, which is similar to plywood. And the mold was maybe six, seven inches wide, and it had that whole curve. So for each one of those three sections, it had that whole curve along the length of it. And I, would, I took, I believe, five layers of 1 inch <coughs> red oak veneer that I purchased. I glue between each layer and then put it into a vacuum bag, which is like a gigantic plastic bag where you pull all the air out and the bag conforms along the mold and then you let that sit for eight to 10 hours and it will dry over the mold. So you take that piece out, and then all of a sudden you have a piece of wood that has that curve on it. So I did that for every single piece. So three different molds. What kind of finish did you put on it on top of the stain? Lacquer. Okay, the hourglass of this is just so perfect in each of the two. <coughs> I can say I'm mistaken. Are there mistakes there? And <coughs> or is your mathematical equation pretty dead on to be able to make it so symmetrical? Well, like any proper artist, when I look at it, all I see are the mistakes. <laughs> um, and there are, yes, there are many, many mistakes. Um, in 2005, so I finished grad school in 2000. In 2005, 
I took a workshop at Anderson Ranch, which is an art school in Colorado that um, has, during the summer, they have one and two week workshops in woodworking, photography, sculpture, ceramics, etc. And I took a workshop for two weeks called All Wood Not Square. And I took it because I, at that point, was about five years post grad school, and I felt like everything that I was making was starting to kind of look similar, and I wanted to get out of that, um, that way of thinking. And so in this workshop, we learned coopering and bent lamination. And the teacher, he showed this mathematical way of basically trying to figure out uh, uh, um, I'm blanking on the term, but when you have curves in multiple directions, and and at first, this was 2005, I remember watching him, like he had all these handouts, as teachers are wont to do, and he talked about all the math, and I thought, there is not a chance I'm going to do that, that sounds horrible, and boring, and... And I, I kept the paperwork, I still have it, and I came back to where I was living at the time, I forget where that was, and I just, I was really inspired by the bed lamination, so I kept working on that, but the whole time I had that memory in the back of my head that I could be hyper-precise if I wanted. And so once I started to think about this form, it all kind of came together where I thought, I know how to make this really precise. I couldn't remember, so it took a while of practicing um, to figure that out. And I just, I think I have like 12 big pieces of paper where I have different views and just creating grids. And, and it was, that was an interesting experience, thinking that you learn something at one point and you might hate it, and you might not realize that somewhere down the line, you might not only remember it, but also be interested in it. So yeah, it was it was a funny moment when I realized that not only could I do this, but I knew how. And you know, and just remembering how visceral my reaction was back in 2005. Due to the fact that you're more more sculpturally and less in terms of furniture and, and sort of where that shift was for you? I think it came from, from really enjoying building furniture but feeling like there, and I still enjoy being building, I still enjoy building furniture, but feeling like um, there was a little too much restraint that was placed on a furniture object. It, whatever it looks like, if, if a desk is going to function as a desk, there are certain things that it has to have in terms of height and size and stuff like that. Same with the chair, same with the cabinet. And, and so I think one of the things that I did for years was I think I made furniture that was kind of trying not to be furniture by playing with the size, or the shape, or its functional, um, physically functional offerings. And so I think that as I moved into non-physically functional work, I think I sort of felt like, like I didn't have those restraints. And so I could get bigger, or I could just, I, I had, freedom to play with size that I didn't have before. And, and I'm still finding that. Like, now the piece that I'm working on is like 20 feet long. And, and so I think that, that, yeah, making, just getting kind of bigger is, is something that I've, that I took super baby steps with for the first maybe dozen years after grad school, and now I'm feeling like I want to be slightly bolder in my steps, like full foot of a step. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering when you were approached to make a piece of this exhibition, 
Yeah, and that's not uncommon. That uh, I'm sure other people have had that experience where someone approaches you and says, two or three years down the road, we want something. So, yeah, so we're going to have some informational sessions or meetings or sketch, um, sketch or model check-ins or something like that along the line. So, yeah, that was, that was fairly common. And really nice. Do you find, and this could be for you or for Julie or do you find it helpful to have some external theme or prompt or a request for a direction that already kind of narrows in your own ideas or to avoid, I mean, you obviously tell the challenge, but I don't think you want to avoid those kinds of requests. For, for shows, I haven't applied to that many because of that, but I do missions for people, um, and I have to have a conversation with them about the piece that they want or some pieces that they want before I decide uh, whether it's going to be in my wheelhouse or two out of out of what I do. Mm -hmm. Then usually a year time time frame for uh, something upcoming or uh, a thinking project. So that's interesting to have such a long time frame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I don't do commissions because there's something about a commission that I feel I feel is way too narrow in my thinking, except if one person. Um, but there's something about, I've done, I've participated in several exhibitions with this particular curator, um, and there's a, there's a way that she presents the subject that feels simultaneously narrow and open, and, and so it's like she's kind of got, like, like a good project in a class, like she sort of, she has this ability to, to guide artists, but give them a ton of flexibility in, in terms of all the decision making. So I do find that to be helpful and exciting. Okay. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to thank all of you for presenting your work. Um, everyone is welcome to stay and enjoy the rest of the exhibition. And thank you, Leah, Emily, and Julie, for. Thank you.